Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the JKMRC Friday Morning Seminar Series. On behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to the ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections with country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So for this seminar, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Hodkowitz. Paul has worked as a geoscientist in the mining industry for 35 years across a range of commodities and mineral systems in exploration, resource development, mining operations, and in senior technical uh, and management roles with Anglo-American, BHP, SRK Consulting, <clears throat> Newmont, and Freeport McMora. He completed his bachelor's and master's degrees in geology and structural geology in the US and a PhD in economic geology at the University of Western Australia. He's currently an independent consultant, advisor and mentor based in Perth. And today he'll be presenting a seminar titled Patterns and Perspectives in Mineral Systems and Mining Systems. So let's give a warm, warm welcome to Paul. All right, thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. it's on. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate that introduction. And thanks also to uh, specifically Mark Nape. He's not here. I hope he's online. Thanks, Mark. He asked me to do this back in December, I think, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, what do I mean by patterns and perspectives? Well, I thought I should uh, start with an example, probably the easiest way to, to do this. And uh, Let's see if it, it works. Here it is. So this is uh, the Red Lake orogenic gold deposit in uh, Canada. It's an Archean orogenic gold system. This is a view of several thousand drill holes. It's a side view on the top. It's an Archean craton, so that's the, that's the surface. And again, this is thousands of drill holes uh, and, and uh or control data over 50 years of mining. And what I'm going to do is spin it around and highlight the high grade gold assays and show what I mean by patterns and perspective to really um, kind of you know look at this and improve our ore body knowledge in this case. And again, it's just one example. So that's spinning around uh, and all the uh, you can see all the levels and the drill holes. And now I'm going to highlight the gold assays are going to show up in red by looking through all the low grade. So this is in ounces per ton because it's North America. So this is really high grade gold in red, say 10 or 15 grams per ton. Now it's going to tilt. You can see kind of a shear zone uh, there, but it's only when you look in the right orientation, and this is the perspective piece, you can see that this is a shear zone and you're looking uh, down dip and down plunge. You can see the uh, the um, folds and the hang wall and foot wall. And this is quite a common feature that you could not, in uh, this sort of idea of looking at for patterns in drill hole data in the right perspective is really important for understanding ore controls and structural controls in this case on the continuity of high grade gold mineralization. So that's what I mean by patterns and perspective. Uh, and again, just to highlight how perspective is really important. And in this case, I'm talking about physical perspective, how you actually look. If you look uh, north in a sectional view, you kind of see some continuity with the shear zone. Uh, if you look west, you don't really see anything, but it's only when you look down plunge, in this case, about minus 60 degrees towards the northwest, and everything resolves into a clear structural feature that is common in orogenic old systems. So that's about uh, physical perspective and patterns. And does anybody recognize this drill hole database? There's a few gray hairs in the audience that, that might recognize this. It, yeah, well, this is the um, Gold Corp Challenge data from 2000. So this is the first example, just a bit of backstory, um, of uh, a company. Gold Corp was a small junior mining company and they were mining the gold, the, the Red Lake deposit, and they were struggling to find targets to uh, define additional reserves. And this was the first crowds uh, sourced 
kind of open innovation competition. And it was in the year 2000. And they just uh, uh, compiled all their geologic information, put it on their website, and opened it up to a competition. And there were hundreds and hundreds of entries. And I think they had about 25 um, uh, um, finalists. And uh, maybe three three of the top finalists shared that twenty five uh, that uh, five hundred thousand dollars, and they discovered, um, I think, several million ounces of gold additional reserves. So that's another example of perspective, you know, mental perspective. So looking at uh, old data in very new ways. So that's a theme I'll I'll cover as well. Again, so perspective is important. So why is that? Important? Well, uh, challenges in mining are not new. This is my favorite exhibit, museum exhibit anywhere, really. It's from the British Museum in London. And uh, believe it or not, it's a 4,000 year old, almost 4,000 year old complaint <clears throat> about the delivery of the wrong grade of copper. Pretty amazing. Um, I think we've probably gotten a little better in 4,000 years, but there's still a challenge with um, you know, producing what we predict we're going to produce. So the theme of this talk is really around improving ore body knowledge, um, finding patterns in old data, just like I showed with the Red Lake, and also new data. So I'm going to talk about new technology like pore scanning and downhole sensing and what we can learn to improve our ore body knowledge with new data. I'll show some examples. And then finally, how that improved ore body knowledge improves our understanding of mineral systems and how those mineral systems can inform mining systems. By what I mean is kind of integrated mining operations. All right, so there I'll, I'll cover a few more uh, topics in patterns in science, right? This is with some quotes. Science is the art of finding patterns in reality. Really like this quote. It's from this book about the hunt for the Higgs boson, right? And uh, I like it because it it acknowledges that there really is a an art piece, a creative piece in some science, particularly when you're looking for patterns. And that's what geology is, right? It's a observational science. So we're always looking for those patterns to fill in the gaps between very sparse locations where we actually have data, whether it's outcrops or drill holes. Now there's another pattern in science and um, this is one, you know, I'm hoping we can avoid by kind of opening up our minds and not waiting for funerals to advance science. But, it, it, you know, this is a common saying in physics. Uh, you could say it in, in a lot of cases. But anyway, um, maybe we can advance geoscience again hey, Steve, without, um, without waiting for the funerals, like I said. So uh, systems. What do I mean by systems? Well, there's a common cartoon of a mineral system from Geoscience Australia, where we're looking at source areas and pathways and, and finally traps. And the definition of a system, kind of the dictionary definition, is it's a regularly interacting or independent group of elements forming an integrated whole, right? So there's mineral systems. And what I mean by mining systems, here's one way to look at it. Uh, sorry, Mark Knoppy raised his hand. Is that... Oh, hi. Hi, Mark. There you go. Sorry. I thought he might have a hard question already. <laughs> Good. Okay. So uh, so that's a mining system up on the left, and then a traditional linear view of a mining value chain, right, where it's, it's from resource and reserve definition on the left through uh, ore control, uh, more detailed definition, in this case, an open pit, various stages of mining, processing, and marketing. That's a very traditional view, and you can see uh, you can, probably can't read it on the bottom, but the geoscience inputs, uh, obviously very high on the left side where we're defining resources and understanding more controls in the pit and then decreasing as you go down towards the, the downstream marketing. But there's another way uh, of looking, uh, of considering a mining system. And uh, that's here, what I call an integrated mining system or uh, integrated mining operation. Right. And what we have the opportunity now is that we're digitizing or we're capturing 
the ore body knowledge as digital data now. And this is with core scans and downhole probes and, and that sort of thing. We're capturing objective digital data that represents the ore body knowledge and the, the rock characteristics of the ore body. So now there's an opportunity to kind of link that digital information with all the sensor enabled equipment that has been quite common for decades, right? Uh, and we have integra um, integrated remote operating centers and autonomous fleets and autonomous systems in all the equipment. And it's through the kind of ore body knowledge in the middle, there's really that opportunity to put much more of the information upstream in our ore body knowledge and link that. So I'll cover that as well. So really the point is here, we've got better data and that's being collected uh, much more. Uh, you could say in the past five or 10 years, there's just been an explosion in the amount of digital geoscience data we've been capturing. I think we're still as an industry figuring out how to use that, um, but it's obviously safer and faster to acquire. It's more reliable. Uh, and like I said, we're learning how to adapt that into ore body knowledge and use things and, and improve our predictions of, for example, mine to mill performance and ultimately to make better decisions, whether they're strategic or mine planning decisions or new opportunities about what kind of minerals and elements we can actually um, uh, acquire from these mineral systems instead of just a few minerals of interest. Now we're able to identify rare earths and critical minerals that are just part of the mineral system, but we've never uh, we've covered them before. So that's the, some of the new opportunities that we have. And another way to think of this is uh, that we're trying to unbake a cake. An ore body is a cake, and really we're trying to unbake it. And I should acknowledge John Van, my old boss at Anglo-American. This was one of his favorite sayings, and uh, it's quite a nice way to think about it. Uh, it's not a homogenous cake, but still we're trying to get all the ingredients and not just a few of the traditionally high value ingredients, but all the ingredients as we unbake it. So I'll go back into a little bit about patterns. Geoscience is, a, is an observational science and as geologists, we're always trying to recognize patterns that tell us something about uh, how something formed in the Earth's crust or what it looks like, right? Whether it's sedimentary texture or structural or erosional or weathering, right? This is what we do as geologists. We're always trying to use our primate pattern-seeking brains and eyes to figure out patterns that make sense. So when we drill a few holes in uh, to an ore body, we have these kind of concepts in the background trying to fill in all the gaps. But we need to be careful about how much we trust our, our eyes, because even though that's what we do as um, pattern-seeking primates, our, our eyes can fool us. And here's an example of that. Maybe some of you remember this from a few year, years ago. Has anybody seen this? How many people see what color? Blue and black? So white and gold, that's what everybody sees. But a lot of people, believe it or not, I think it's usually about a third or 25% of people see that dress as blue and black instead of white and gold. So you really, and this was a meme on the internet several years ago, but it's just the way our eyes can trick us sometimes. Um, Color blindness is, is obviously a more extreme example of that, but we need to be careful about how much we uh, trust our eyes. So going from that to something a little more practical, what color is the core? This is what we see on the left with a narrow band of in the electromagnetic spectrum of what we can see with our human eyes. But when we scan that same core with shortwave infrared, with a core scanning system, we can see all the colors representing different uh, silicates and clay minerals on the left very clearly and much less uh, more objectively. So there's, there's uh, you know, no question about the different mineral assemblages we're seeing. And this is the opportunity that we can use that objective digital information to really improve that ore body knowledge. And Steve, you're gonna like this next one. What color is the rock, right? This is uh, from high spec. And uh, this is a lithium bearing pegmatite in Portugal shown up there in blue compared to what you can see with your human eyes. And this is from hyperspectral scanning from a drone, right? So these systems are much more common 
now and we have this opportunity to use this sort of information to really improve that ore body knowledge. Okay, now perspective. A couple more things about perspective. What do we mean? Well, we saw that in the in the uh, drill hole data, but uh, this is an example from the campus at University of Western Australia from a couple of years ago. And uh, there were these displays around campus. And if you were walking up to them, they didn't make much sense until you looked down plunge. And in this case, you could see this is a picture of Barry Marshall. And uh, he was Nobel laureate. And he took that quote about uh, advancing science through funerals, maybe a little too literally, because he ingested the bacterium to prove that that's the cause of ulcers. And luckily, he didn't die. And he won a Nobel Prize. But it's a really good example of perspective, kind of physical perspective and mental perspective, right? Now, here's another example of perspective. Uh, this is street art. And again, unless you look from the right direction, you can't make much sense of that, right? And, and I've highlighted here, this is um, a paper by Jun Cowan, uh, and where he calls this uh, idea X-ray plunge projection. And uh, it's a paper from 2014 in the Oz IMM Guide to Good Practice, where he kind of uh, uh, presents this idea about looking at drill hole data uh, to find certain patterns of, of continuity and ore controls. <clears throat> so again, I'll go back to this Red Lake example, just to remind you about the, this idea of perspective and what's really important. And now imagine, this is just looking at gold, right? So we can see the shear zone, we can see the, the uh, folds and the hang wall and foot wall. But imagine if those drill holes were painted with these mineral maps from hyperspectral core scans. And we could see different clay mineral assemblages or silicate mineral assemblages in you know blue, pink, or green colors. Imagine what that would look like when you're looking down plunge. You'd see all these alteration halos around the, the ore zone associated with this sort of uh, hydrothermal system. For example, again, this is orogenic gold. So again, just think about what you would see uh, with different colors, not just the uh, gold mineralization, but all the other alteration assemblages. Now, here's another example in animation. This is from banded iron formation. Same thing, hundreds of thousands of blast hole samples this is a pit shell that's probably three kilometers long, and there's a little animation in it. So again, all the blast holes turn on that X-ray feature. You can see the high-grade iron ore. And then when you tilt it in the right orientation, you can see these broad open folds. No surprise, that's what you see in these sorts of banded iron formations, right? And in this case, <clears throat> um, you can go out into the pit and validate it so you can see Mind geologists there for scale. You can see these broad open folds. And this is important because uh, it's with the uh, kind of advances in autonomous equipment, uh, the opportunities for mind geologists to actually go out in the pit and do some mapping are vastly reduced. It's almost impossible now to go to, uh, regularly out into an active open pit and mine. So using this sort of information, for example, from grade control drilling, and from say drone scans is really the only mapping you can do. Uh, and uh, using this sort of information just to validate what you see from your uh, laser digital elevation models is, is really might be the only way we can do it. So it's virtual mapping, but you're validating it with a, a range of different data sets. So here's, um, one more example. This is from a porphyry copper deposit. And again, there's the open pit, thousands of drill holes, um, grade control drilling from blast holes. And, and I'll do the same thing, zoom through, and we're going to look at the distributions of the copper, moly, and arsenic. And this has more of a geotech application. So there's uh, copper, high grade, and a kind of brecciated core. Now it's tilting. Away from you, you can see the molly rich zone there tilting back up and see those veins. Those are kind of conjugate sets of late arsenic rich veins. And I'll go now it's uh, I'll go to this screenshots of them. So what was really interesting here, and this was 
many years ago, but um, so it's not something that's mined out. This is still a very active operation, but those arsenic veins, you can see them through kind of that brittle core of the system. The geotech team at the mine was most interested in that because uh, again, there'd been no mapping in the open pit. So there was no record of those arsenic veins in the middle of the pit, but they, the geotech team was able to trace those using those trends and follow them into the high walls, which they hadn't been able to map before. So from their uh, high resolution laser scans of the high wall, they were able to validate the orientations of those veins and, and track them as the open pit expanded. So this is a case where, again, and it's, it's always a bit messy, right? This idea of you know, blast hole sampling at the best of times is fraught with problems. But when you have 100,000 samples, and if 80% of them are kind of telling you the right thing, you can see these patterns. And that's really the point, right? The idea, if you can't take good samples, take lots of samples and something will fall out. And you have to use your judgment, of course. Uh, but in this case, it was really valuable to, to understand the, the orientation of those arsenic veins. So the point is really that the patterns we see from all that closely spaced data reveals process. So it does tell you something about how rock formed or how um, it was deformed or altered or weathered or eroded. So you know we're not um, getting away from our understanding of geological process when we think about large data sets like this. So what are the new opportunities? Uh, well, we touched on uh, digital drill core data from scans this is a core scan system where we're getting high resolution uh, mineral data from shortwave infrared. There's autonomous drilling and analysis. That's a index blast dog probe that goes along and follows blast hole drilling in an open pit and um, acquires petrophysics, things like gamma, conductivity, magnetic susceptibility, all in a semi-autonomous system. So it tells a lot more about the rock mass that can be, uh, that can complement what we know about the ore control drilling and sampling. And then of course on the, on the right, sensor enabled mapping. This is much more common these days with scanning with a drone system. So here's an example uh, from a coal mine. It's a long wall, open pit coal mine. And there's a high resolution LIDAR scan of that. And you can see the, the colors representing the sedimentary features. And then the drill holes were all, um, the, the blast dog probe was used in all those drill holes. So again, you can, and, and also validated with measure wall drilling information from the blast hole drilling. So there's a whole combination of, of data sets there, and you can see how the, the colors in the drill holes really match this, the sedimentary features in the background. So that's a, a validation step. But now imagine if you had thousands of these drill holes across a bench, you'd be pretty confident you could map out the stratigraphy just based on measure wall drilling data and downhole probe information. So that's the sort of opportunity we have with, with uh, this new information. Okay, and what are the other uh, patterns? You know, why should we use spectral data? So, I'll... well, here's a, a good example. Again, what we see with our human eyes on the left from a piece of core, what we can see when it's scanned. And then this is just a pie chart showing the ore. This is the composition of the bulk ore mineralogy that is sent to the mill. So in a, in a you know, in a high grade, copper deposits say, if we have 1% of the ore minerals, the other 99% is still gang, but it's still in the ore. And, and it's all the gang minerals, the silicates or the clay minerals that influence the hardness and the throughput and the flotation and the recovery of the minerals. So our better understanding of the 99% uh, of the gang mineral mineralogy in the in the ore that shipped to the mill is why this scanning information uh, is so important. So
so uh, again, what are the new patterns that we can get from that new data? Well, here's just a, a bit of a workflow of a, of a digital courtyard, if you want. There's some drilling, some televiewer data up on the left, then a core scanning system. But the main point here is um, when all that information gets into 3D, one way to think about drill holes with all this rich information now is that they're long, skinny outcrops, really. And the ability to view all those drill holes in a 3D environment is a mapping exercise. It turns into a mapping exercise, just like we would have learned in introductory you know, field mapping, where you go out and you're trying to see features in different outcrops that you can connect and, and find those patterns between, but also where you always want to look down dip or a long strike or down plunge. Those are the idea, those are the concepts that we can now use when we have all this information showing texture and mineral assemblages in the drill holes. And when we have enough drill holes, we can map that. So that's a different way of thinking about the modeling that we might do instead of drill hole by drill hole or even section by section. Uh, it's looking at it in three dimensions. And there are, you know, there are some um, developments happening in, in the industry right now where, where this is done. And it, and it comes, oil and gas have been doing it for decades, right? Because they have 3D seismic and they might only have a few wells that cost a hundred million dollars, but they have every bit of information from those wells about the texture from the downhole probes, right? So uh, we can drill many more holes for a lot less money, but our opportunity also is to integrate all these different data sets. And again, think about mapping between drill holes instead of just traditional logging one at a time. So here's again, a few more examples of mineralogy from uh, open pit ore control samples. This is a bench and these are heat maps. So here's the silicates on the top. These are hundred meter grid lines. So that's about 600 meters long in an open pit and across several benches. And this is information that was acquired from ore control drilling, RC drilling in a pit far in advance of mining. And all the mineralogy was captured. And you could see the heat maps where you have uh, plagioclase, orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene uh, concentrations in the bench, in the benches, and uh, all the clay minerals, talc, chlorite, serpentine on the bottom for this particular bench. And this is the sort of information that is incredibly interesting for mine planning because you want to understand this. There might be opportunities to adjust the mine plan to take advantage of the uh, ore body characteristics that affect throughput or crushing and grinding or fragmentation, which is to say all the silicates or the minerals, the clay minerals that influence uh, ro uh, recovery and flotation. So now we can acquire this information kind of at scale. And um, this is the opportunity for inputs into mine planning. And, and again, it's only in the past uh, probably five years where we've started to capture all this high resolution mineralog mineralogical data at scale. The technology has been around for a long time, um, but it really only, and I don't know if it was a COVID thing, but a lot of companies started to scan a lot more core when the geologists couldn't get out into the core yard. And so, uh, you know, five years ago, you might have had a company that had scanned a few holes as a proof of concept. Now there are many companies that have hundreds of holes scanned, whether they're RC chips in this case or, or core. So you can start to uh, figure out how to map all that new information. And again, it's, it's kind of a, there's been a bit of a critical tipping point where now we have enough of this information to make sense of it. And I, I don't think we're there yet. There's still challenges about how to use all this, but the opportunity to look at it at scale with close enough drilling, close uh, space drilling is where we'll take advantage of that opportunity. So here's another example of kind of combining our understanding of the distribution of those silicate and clay minerals. The, the scatter plot on the left just comes from uh, a mill, and these are samples that come out of the mill after the fact. And the metallurgists were able to say, 
Well, they could distinguish broadly eight different ore types based on the proportions of clay minerals and silicate minerals. And each of those eight different ore types, as an example, had different performances through the process, through the uh, metallurgical process in the mill. And what we did is we took those categories and painted the information from the drilling. And you could see that those, it's kind of an empirical way to look at all that mineralogical data, but it actually hangs together spatially. You could see that ore type eight is the purple stuff and it actually hangs together. The yellow hangs together, the black. So there's something about those different proportions of ore types that were only determined after the fact in the mill uh, that actually hang together in the pit. So this again is really important for mine planning. I think mine planning teams would wanna know uh, if there's an opportunity to either campaign or blend based on this sort of information to improve uh, throughputs and recovery. And one last slide like this. Um, and ideally this would be for multiple benches, multiple benches of uh, mineral domains, right? And if we step through these, right? You can see if we have all this advanced drilling or control drilling where we're going through multiple benches, we can get a continuous uh, model just showing there in the red and green that is continuous across, for example, three benches. Traditionally, over on the right is what we're still doing, which is all the mine planning based on kind of discontinuous partial information from blast hole patterns. And you can see there's a lot, it's the same information, but this is a 3D model across several benches. And this is how that material was actually mined if you step down through those same three benches. You can see not a lot of ideal continuity there. So the opportunity is to deliver models, these kind of 3D multi-bench mineral domains far in advance of the mining to give the mine planning team uh, much better information compared to what is still commonly done here. Okay, last slide. So what can we do to improve this 4,000 year old trend of improvement? Um, so just a few of the key takeaways. I think there's lots to learn from large legacy data sets. And uh, I was actually just thinking on the way over uh, today, maybe this is an opportunity for uh, SMI or JKMRC to, to get you know, these large old grade control data sets from corporate sponsors from ore bodies that have been mined out and um, build some models and, and show what it actually looked like. Because when you have 10 meter spacing between your blast holes or, or grade control drilling, uh, you can actually see what the ore body really looked like and then compare it to the, uh, the, the dig lines from the blast patterns, the way it was actually mined and compared to the reconciliation reports. And it could kind of it'd be a very interesting way to kind of have a forensic analysis of, uh, of how an ore body was mined and what, you know, what would be the optimal way to mine it if you had all that more detailed information now. So anyway, that's an opportunity to learn from these legacy data sets. And again, uh, another key point is that with all this new information, remember that we're looking for patterns, but also with perspective, not only physical perspective, looking in the right orientation in 3D, but also a mental perspective, keep our minds open about what we might find, right? And then this ultimately this new data will improve lower body knowledge and reveal new minerals and elements, right? The ingredients of that cake and reveal new 3D patterns to help unbake the cake for the customers. So I'll finish with a, a couple of quotes. Again, uh, Stephen Hawking said this, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. You could even put in ore body knowledge. I don't think Stephen Hawking was talking about ore body knowledge, but you could put those words in there, right? It's not what we don't know, it's actually what we think we know. And of course, Mark Twain had an even more beautiful way of saying exactly the same thing. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure. That just ain't so. Ain't so. So anyway, that's, I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. Thanks. And thank you very much, Paul. Um, any questions? I have one, just to start a little bit. Sure. So. 
which which analytical technique it's being used to estimate the mineralogy that you showed there in those models? You showed like the the, the mineral distribution and the model. Oh, right. It, that yeah. was uh, well. In some cases, that was uh, scanning hyperspectral scanning yeah. chips. Yeah. Or um, Fourier transform infrared. Yeah. Um, mineralogy. Right. Yeah. Because you can do it at scale. Those yeah. are things where you can do hundreds of samples, uh, you know, for a few dollars a sample at, at, compared to quantitative XRD. All right. Example, which yeah. Is much less common. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Questions. All right. Nick. So I was intrigued by the first uh, red lake picture with the, the shape of the gold. So I'd like you to comment, if possible, on the geometry of the host rock reaction control in lots of those systems. Because And we, we talk about things like the gang assemblages and so forth. And there's two things I suppose I'd comment about that. Is one, when you go to the highest grade, often you've used up one of the reactive components so you can't see the whole system. So unbaking the cake actually requires you to go out to a part where you've only partially used the components to make the reaction. Yeah. But secondly, I find that we tend to, you know, I, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, or in, but you assume the fold and yet you wonder about the geometry of the reactive control of the host rocks. Um, and sometimes we, I don't know whether we actually show them enough together um, I'd like to hear your opinion on the, yeah, that. Yeah, well, I don't, I'm not an expert on the Red Lake deposit, but I guess um, in that case, it was really the point there was that you're highlighting with, you know, I think it was over two or 300,000 individual assays. Um, you're really highlighting uh, though that kind of shear zone with the folds. I don't know what the geometry of the, Host rocks are. It's obviously a very deformed system, typical of orogenic systems. It's, it's a mountain belt, right? And so there's finding plunges and steeply dipping uh, shear zones like that is is very common. It's just usually we don't see the folds because the the hinges are gone. But in the case of the mineralization here, you could see it quite clearly. And in this case, actually, the result was that the um, they were able to use that sort of information and define additional reserves and following those plunging shoots down plunge. So yeah, uh, the, the reaction of the host rocks, I, I don't know. And, but it didn't, it didn't die out. Those trends continued to depth, which is also a very common feature of orogenic gold systems. They go for a long way. And that was after 50 years of mining. And I think they're still mining there, but certainly after that exercise in the year 2000, they added another several million ounces of reserves based on that, again, that kind of uh, open competition, but they were able to use that understanding of the structural controls to, to drill out additional reserves. We have some online questions, quite interesting ones. So Josio, Vargas is uh, asking, could you please comment on how would you approach transferring the knowledge from scanning at different scales? So for example, uh, they got like abundant drill hole scanning data sets, but when you change to different samples, media, blast holes, rock chips, the patterns and relationships that you might have proof with geology at drill hole scale may not be the same. So I think, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess it's, um... The information you can get from close space drilling, you know, it's not necessarily always a fractal relationship or whatever you want to call it, but there's something that you determine from very close space drilling that then you have to extrapolate and say, well, could I potentially see those same patterns and features in areas that are more widely spaced? So again, it's a, you know, I don't know if there's any rigorous workflow here, but it's a, it's it's using our brains and eyes and ability to fill in the gaps uh, between more widely spaced drill hole data. But I wouldn't say there's rigorous workflows yet. And again, we're just learning how to, uh, learning as an industry, how to use all this information. There's still a gap between all this incredibly high resolution, detailed mineralogical data uh, and how that is best put into a practical modeling workflow. Because we can see that information at pixel scale, which in some cases is 
tens of microns, hundreds of microns, but we're mining at meter scale and we model at meter scale. So I think there's still um, a challenge about getting all that very detailed information into the right intervals that are practical for not only the resource modeling, but also the mining methods we're using. And there is a gap there, so I, there's no solution yet. There is more online questions. So Michael Whitbread, he asks, which company do you think is most ahead in the data integration game? All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of companies, you know, it's interesting with the core scanning, for example, a lot of gold companies were early adopters. Uh, New Newcrest, particularly, um, uh, just in a recent SEG newsletter, Anthony Harris just had a brilliant paper on kind of the history of Newcrest, and and you know they were very early adopters of that information. Um, I was very fortunate over the past few years at BHP and Anglo American to be you know part of some big scanning programs, and and like I said, a lot of companies are just learning how to use that, but the gold companies particularly because they could they could clearly see the clay minerals that had such an influence on the, the, the not only the understanding of the ore body, but also the recovery of the gold through the metallurgy. Yeah. metallurgy. So I'm not going to get into a, yeah. <laughs> a, a discussion about who's best, but I think everybody's moving along. And also the, you know, the price of scanning is coming down a bit. So it's uh, instead of just the majors, you know, it's a lot of the more agile mid-size and smaller companies are doing it much more regularly now too all right um did i did i skirt around that one so <laughs> so there is uh marks to send thanks thanks Paul. he is probably not here because he's recovering from some flu yes so but he was watching online so he has with the increasing difficult to access tenements to drill to define mineral resource or or reserves to a high level of confidence to support studies do you see that we will be able to use non-physical assays to inform the confidence of the estimates and not only you not only complement, but to some degree replace physical assays? What does this mean for digital QA QC? Oh. There's always challenges with yeah, QA QC. I think it's you know, it has to be the, the question you're asking. Uh if it's an exploration stage, you just want to know enough information to say. Is there a sniff here? Do I keep drilling? Do I drill the next hole? If if it's about uh, you know gaining confidence in a resource model and infill drilling to really confirm the continuity or the geometry that you're uh, trying to understand, then then that you know you obviously want to go with more reliable um, analytical methods. But you know it it just depends when you need you know what kind of decision you need to make and when you need to make it in a in a field environment in an exploration environment do you need results overnight well you might if you want that information to decide whether you're going to drill your next hole or move on to a different tenement um, but companies are already using that information um, xrf scanning and, and hyperspectral scanning that's already being used in the field in exploration to make those sorts of decisions when it can be done practically uh, in a field environment. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's that the whole QA, QC side of this is also evolving how much we want to trust this data, but it depends on what question we're asking. No, all right. Um, thanks for a great talk. It was very interesting. I'm a metallurgist, not a geologist. Um, you um, there was a throwaway line during your talk where you said there's a bit more work to do on how we deal with this stuff. Um, I wondered if you could explore that a little bit more. Before you do, I'll just tell you a, a little anecdote uh, against my profession. For years, miners and geologists have increased their capacity to tell us what's coming into the concentrator. So the predictions are much better and the mine plan is much better and so on. Um, and you might think that makes the metallurgist's life easier. Well, I think if you pinned the metallurgist up against the wall and said, so what? Mm. You know, it's the dreaded word, so what? What happens now? They'd say, hmm, well, actually, I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with that information because concentrators are inflexible. You can't change them. I'd like to be able to say to you, send me that ton, but not that ton. Yeah. That's not going to happen. So 
it seems to be the next phase, and I think you said that, is is really how do we put together more sophisticated ways of, of dealing with this data and applying it and getting from it a better operation? And, you know, is the dreaded AI part of that yeah. future? Yeah, and I, you know, the scale, and that's, I'm married a metallurgist, so I'm okay to talk to you. It's yeah. fine, so. <laughs> um, the, yeah, big, you know, large um, concentrators and processing systems, like I said, yeah, they're, they're kind of inflexible and they're just designed around a, a very broad average. But there's been a lot of discussion over the last several years when you think about new technology and how it would, how it would be applied to mining is this idea of precision mining. You know, with much less, um, uh, you know, waste to ore, and also um, modular processing. You know, maybe that's not happening right now, but this idea that if we can extract certain parts of the ore body in a more precise way, and then send that through different processing streams, that we would recover it more effectively with a lower energy and carbon footprint and less water. So those are discussions that are happening throughout the industry, but. Yeah, we're nowhere near building modular systems like that yet, and and there is a really big challenge in in the industry. What you know, most companies have to go to get funding to to fund uh, a new operation. What bank or fund is going to invest in totally untested new technology like that for recovering the resource? But again, that's it's a very active discussion happening right now. And this is just talking about the minerals or the elements of interest traditionally, the precious or base metals or something else. But because we can identify all the other minerals, critical minerals, rare earth elements that are actually part of all mineral systems, is there additional value we can extract from that information as well as, as additional recovery uh, and value from an ore body? And that, that's very active discussion as well that maybe the concentrator uh, we can't do much about and it's still just bulk material that we ship to that but maybe there's something on the downstream side before it goes to tailings or before it goes to waste where we can extract these other critical minerals or elements that we now know about because we know we can track them from the pit all the way through the process so i think that's an opportunity that uh, the industry is still working on uh, I, 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 yeah, I guess it could. I, I'm not a data scientist, but I'd imagine if you have all this digital data captured from in place through all the stages, um, you know, uh, to the streams out the downstream end, and could you optimize that? Yeah, we use AI for all kinds of other uh, spatial data and, um, you know, uh, 3D data and, and time series data. So why couldn't we do it now? Because we are tracking that material now from in place, like I said, through time series. Hey, Paul. Hey. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk, great. And um, my question was, uh, what's happening in, in terms of the propagation of uncertainty uh, with these data sets through, because we can now begin to quantify uncertainty with this data in a much more precise way. And, um, but propagating that through the way that the mine planning is done and the mills are optimized um, seems to me like a, yeah. a great next step. And I know some companies are doing it. I'd love to know your perspective. Yeah, 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 good question. Um... <laughs> I don't have a really um, easy answer for that, but I, I guess we, the, it's almost like the more information you get, the more, you know, the degrees of uncertainty kind of expand, but, but um, uh, I, you know, one way to think about it is we just, we're not kidding ourselves, maybe to go to these quotes, right? That, that we, we know more, we're, we're kind of expanding our understanding of these ore bodies. So we're expanding that ore body knowledge, but it's increasing the uncertainties about how we can recover it in the best way, for example, or how to plan. And that's where I think, you know, the real, and you kind of made the point that the mine planning function is really important because they're kind of the link between all this ore body knowledge and what we're actually trying to recover. So I think more 
engagement uh, with with kind of a mind planning function to say, well, what would you do if you had all these variables in your models? Would that change the mind plan? Um, uh, that probably didn't answer your question, but th this idea of, uh, you yeah, know, there's much smarter people that that I think can can uh, take all this information and, and do better things. So I have another question. So I'm not a metallurgist, but like I saw that we see we see lately a lot of advanced on mineralogy, a lot of data acquisition on this side. So do you see a lot of advance for like huge data set acquisition on comminution of metallurgy, like new technologies that are fast tracking, getting more data set to within companies? Because usually like the geomet data is a little bit yeah. more sparse than what you have from meta uh, mineralogy or geochemical. Yeah, well, I mean, there's certainly you can get more mineralogical data, but the physical test work, like that's interesting. Actually, yesterday I was out at Core Resources, which has these is it GOPora, the, these systems that actually um, get uh, geometallurgical information um, much more rapidly uh, over a, you know, a large number of samples. So there's an opportunity and there's other you know, companies doing uh, similar things where you can get kind of physical characteristics that directly relate, that you can use to directly relate your understanding of the mineralogy and the texture to the the um, fragmentation or the crushing or the grinding performance of the material. So I think that is a critical piece where we need to get more of those physical tests and geomet tests in place. And we need, again, they might not be perfect samples, but if you get thousands of them across an ore body, you're likely to see the right trends. Start to see some patterns, right? Yeah. And a better perspective. That's Just to have, oh, I think you have some online question. The last one. Um, right, so someone asked, like, have you worked with examples of waste rock dumps? No? No, I haven't. But, I mean, that's an obvious one I think I mentioned, right? We're going to know a lot more about what's in the waste dumps and tailings because it's better characterized on the input. Yeah. So, you know, there's an obvious opportunity there. And to use some of the same information for analyzing um, tailings and waste dumps, right? To characterize them as... The remnants of the ore body that's now on the surface. You know, I was at uh, the mine waste symposium yeah. about a month ago, more, right? And that was yeah. a very common topic there. So, Mark has another question. So, I hear that the interpretation of new vast extents of scanning result has, in some places, turned a previous interpretation from the chemical assay that alone once had. Do you have examples of this and what's dramatic new interpretation was possible? Yeah, I don't have exact examples of that that I can show, but I've certainly seen uh, with some of the scanning programs I've been involved in where when you do show hundreds of holes with these new mineral assemblages colored and you try to map between those holes, the, you know, the, the, the continuity of those altered rocks looks very different than the cartoon uh, models from textbooks say. So I think there's a real opportunity to rewrite the understanding of some of the mineral systems, whether it's porphyries or layered intrusions or orogenic gold systems. You know, we're looking at so much more information now that I think uh, it, it will influence not only the understanding of the genesis and formation, but more importantly, the geometry of what these things look like, because we just have so much more information. So I can't show any examples, but I've seen them and, and yeah. they're out there and I think they'll become more common and, and maybe get published and distributed uh, soon enough. Yeah. So I want, so we have more online questions. So Mark Lindsay, um, he, he thanks you for the talk. So sterilizing areas is a key decision. Are there any techniques or data sets that are particularly useful here? Or is just flipping the question of where is it the war body to where is it not? Why using the same techniques and data? Yeah, well, and it's a very general response, but um, with this information, 
uh, you know, beyond just the ore minerals, you can consider, uh, you know, the, the more kind of precision mining opportunities. And again, we might not have the technology there, but but instead of just big building big giant open pits that require larger and larger equipment, can we mine them with smaller equipment and be more selective? Or underground particularly, can you be much more selective and really um, focus in on the high value parts, whether that's traditional minerals and elements or anything else, and leave the rest? It, you know, so it's really, uh, I think this technology, again, no direct answer, but it, it's kind of uh, providing that opportunity to understand the ore body in such detail that you can start to consider new mining methods and new equipment and more selective methods. So it's, again, it's just telling you more broadly, better ore body knowledge allows you to think of different uh, development opportunities. All right, so maybe last question, um, Andy Reynolds, uh, is all the new data revealing any shortcomings in fundamental geostatistic methods? Right. Yeah. Good question. I <laughs> I don't know. That's interesting. I think geostatistics. I'm not a geostatistician by any stretch, but um, this idea of building kind of spatial domains based on the mineralogy or the proportions of different minerals is really interesting to think about. Those as spatial domains um, that hang together, and are they valid for the the resource model? Um, and thinking about those mineral assemblages, kind of thinking about what, what it actually looks like now, instead of trying to think about, well, what were the rock types when it first formed? Well, that may or may not be important because it formed 2 billion years ago. So the original rock types are, are not there anymore. And do we need to understand that geometry or should we focus more on the mineral assemblages as they occur now in the geometry? I think on the, on the, you know, understanding how it formed, that's very important for targeting and exploration and, and understanding of the genesis of ore systems, of mineral systems. But uh, for kind of practical inputs to mine planning, I think this new data maybe provides opportunities for different domaining opportunities. And that would have to be, yeah, validated through uh, by geostats. Yeah. So, general. All right, so I'll ask everyone to thank Paul for his presentation. And just heads up, uh, we had a short notice and next week the, our presenter won't be able to come. So we won't have the JKMRC Friday seminar next week. Okay, so thanks everyone. All right, thank you.